<laughs> All righty, guys. Thank you for coming to our talk today. So today we've actually got a fellow Telstra Purple senior consultant with us, Brenton Aidy. He will be doing a talk on training a PowerPoint AI to play tic-tac-toe. Now, he is actually a tutor also for the University of Western Australia Data and Analytics Bootcamp. He's got a pretty interesting background with a Bachelor of Science majoring in Maths and Psychological Science and a Master of Applied Artificial Intelligence on the way. Data is a rapidly growing domain and it is his vision to spread awareness of the power that comes with taking control of data. Over to you, Brenton. Wonderful. Cool. So, uh, pretty provocative title there. Uh, a little bit clickbaity. Uh, <laughs> Surely this is just a trick, you might say, just like a play on words to get you through those doors. And don't worry, we will get into it. We will get into this magical PowerPoint AI. But before we talk about that, we need to understand what AI is, what artificial intelligence is. More specifically, we're going to talk about one avenue that we get through to get to AI, which is machine learning. So before we go any further, I feel like I do have to warn you guys. This isn't actually a talk about PowerPoint or tic-tac-toe. <laughs> if you came in here hoping to get the latest tips and tricks on creating flashy slide decks and, and mastering the game of tic-tac-toe, then, well, one, I'm profoundly sorry, and two, you maybe should have read the talk description a little bit more. There's time to leave if you want. Um, but AI, then. AI is a term that floats around a lot these days. It's usually as some ex machina style magic to solve all of the world's problems. Which, I mean, it's great for me because it means that I get to wander around pretending like I'm some Chris Angel in my day job analyzing data. But you see, a magician never reveals his secrets. The difference here, me, a data scientist, I'm going to take you behind the curtain and see how simple machine learning and AI really are and how applicable it is to so many different scenarios more than you might expect, even, say, a PowerPoint. But if we're going to talk about machine learning, and some of you might be aware of this, then there's something we can't avoid talking about. Maths. That's right. I tricked you all into a 45-minute lecture. <laughs> a grueling, repetitive, <laughs> complex maths. Who's excited? Except, we don't really need to talk about maths to talk about machine learning. As much as I would love to get into intricacies of stochastic gradient descent or cross-entropy loss between distributions, those of you who just felt the blood rush from your face as I mentioned the word maths can relax just a little bit. But then that begs the question, if we're not going to talk about maths, what are we going to talk about? You see, if you looked on the definition of machine learning from our friendly site, Wikipedia, you would get machine learning algorithms build a model based on sample data, known as training data, in order to make predictions, decisions, without being explicitly programmed to do so. That bit's important, so keep it in the back of your mind. But this is wild, right? This must be some wild new innovation. We've got sample data, we're making predictions and decisions. Except this quote is often attributed to someone called Arthur Samuel in 1952. Arthur Samuel was a pioneer of machine learning in IBM, and he was building systems to play checkers right back in 1949. But what about all this stuff I'm hearing about neural networks, computer vision? Surely being able to get a computer to see images, that must be new and wild, right? This is a schematic for the Mark I perceptron. This an, is an initial machine learning algorithm that was trying to mimic the workings of the human mind, which sounds super fancy. It was used in early computer vision models to, for image recognition in 1957. Now, although the technology has changed a little bit, the same fundamental principles are still being used today, and it's solely responsible for the resurgence we saw in neural networks in 1990s. 
This might be a bit strange, not what you would expect. But you see, despite what the buzzwords might say, machine learning is not just for big data. Machine learning is not just for large-scale compute, for people who have all the money in the world to throw at, uh, which maybe Microsoft will get mad at me for saying. Um, <laughs> machine learning is its not magic. If that's what machine learning is not, then what is machine learning? We're going to talk about what machine learning is, and hopefully, by the end of this, you'll be able to come, on me with the, come with me on the journey to how we can create a machine learning out of something stupid. <laughs> machine learning is a way of constructing a model that describes things about the real world without having to explicitly program it every detail. In a way, it's about transferring knowledge from the unknown, from the known to the unknown. And we do this sort of learning in our real day lives every day so much so that it's pretty much second nature. When I was a kid, I spent a lot of hours playing the guitar. I probably should have spent more hours doing my hair. Um, <laughs> That's the sacrifices we make, right? Except for one time in high school where we were auditioning for a musical, which the mic is important, um, and maybe five, six, upwards of that amount of people were trying to audition for guitar, but no one was auditioning for bass, and I said, how hard can it be going from six strings to four? Easy. Except any musician who has tried to transfer from guitar to bass will know that there are transferable skills. There's a lot more knowledge that you need to gain before you can uh, successfully play the bass. My first few perform performances, I absolutely bombed. I thought, I started out thinking that I would have all my knowledge in guitar that would easily transfer it into um, Base. But this wasn't the case. It was only after successive practicings, learnings, failings, that I managed to get to where I am today. Put it another way, let's assume we have a group of people, much like yourselves, tasked with predicting the result of a coin flip. And for every correct guess, you get a cookie. Uh, that's just so that we make sure that people take this very serious experiment seriously. Without prior knowledge, except for the fact that maybe a coin has two sides, I think we can agree, to, within a certain margin of error, that 50% of the group will get a cookie. So we run this. One flip, turns up heads. Two flips, turns up heads. Three flips, heads, and what a coincidence, some might say. Others might start to catch on. Four flips, turns up heads. Five flips, turns up heads and a group start, might start getting suspicious. Cookies are flying left and right. Given enough time, people will learn the ploy of this con man. Tis no ordinary coin. The group starts around here, 50%. But then with successive coin flips and the promise of cookies getting ever more enticing, we start to learn of the coin's true nature. nature. By guessing and getting it wrong, or guessing and getting it right and being rewarded constantly, over and over again, we can start to induce that the information is not that the coin is a regular coin, but it is a double-sided, headed, double-headed coin. So, what is that? How can we abstract that away from that experience of us learning after successive coin flips and apply it to something in the maths world or the computer world? There are many types of machine learning that you might have heard of. Supervised, unsupervised, reinforcement learning, semi-supervised. But fundamentally, they all follow the same three basic steps. We need to create a test. What is the model trying to do? We need to define a way to score the test. How, well do, we, how do we tell if a model is good or bad at what it's trying to do? And lastly, most importantly, we need to find a way to punish or reward the model for the score it received. So again, the idea here is that if we take the fundamental components of what a machine learning algorithm is, stripping away all the maths, complexity, and high compute power, we can find ways to implement it in something simple. And we need to know these steps if we're going to build an AI from the ground up with machine learning in, say, a PowerPoint. Maybe. I don't know. Is that why you're here? Indulge me for a minute while we walk down Metaphor Lane. We're going to open up Brenton's School of Machine Learning Studies. 
In this school, we have students day in, day out, trying to produce results. Our school is the model, and our students are just instances of training that model. Get this school to learn and perform in one of the top schools, we need to define a test. This test is how we're going to judge how well the school performs. When we conduct a test, each student will get a score, and our student score is and our school score is some aggregation of the student score. Who doesn't love standardized tests, right? After the test, we need to define what it means to pass or fail it. What does it mean for a student to do well in the test? What is a good score? What is a bad score for the school? What will end us end up in us losing the funding and turning off the lights forever? Lastly, we need to define how we're going to punish the students who have failed and reward those who did well. This is a standardized test, and again, our school will be based off the aggregated score of all of our students, so we want to maximize the amount of students passing by whatever means necessary. And we do this many, many times. Each time, a student is getting punished if it gets the test wrong, or it's getting rewarded if it's doing it better. It's important to note here that the students are the one learning after each test. They are what makes this machine learning school a machine learning model. And you can't just go ahead and reward or punish a school in, as a whole. Anyone who's tried to organize any group of kids will know that that's just not possible. What you do have control over is the individual students running their tests. And you have the ability to learn, uh, to get them to learn or um, change their scores. Now, you might say a different approach to this is to try and get every student to memorize the answer of every single test question in the test, which, yes, it's an option. It will get a pretty good score. But then, say, a new school board ru runs around and says, we don't like this test. We're going to define a new one. All of a sudden, you have to do all of the rework in getting all of these hundreds, thousands of students in the school to relearn their answers. It's not efficient, and I know that I can't memorize a standardized test. Uh, for the best of days. The key thing here is that you can run a test on any model, but if there exists no process to punish or reward the model based on the test score, then it's simply not a machine learning model. So that's a little bit of fun down metaphor lane, but let's look at this in the real world. What you're looking at here is an example of the MNIST data set. It's sort of said as the hello world of computer vision, whatever that's worth. It's a data set containing 70,000 labeled, handwritten digits. Uh, uh, 60,000 of those are training, and 10,000 of those are testing. The name of the game is to get a model that classifies an unseen handwritten digit as 0 through to 9. So in this case, our test is pretty simple. Is the predicted digit equal to the actual labeled digit? So. We try and approach this in the simplest way possible. Our first model might be a random guess. This is about as simple as we can get. We just simply ran get randomly guess a number between 0 and 9 and assign the label to be that. This model is quite easy to test, actually. In fact, if we did it, then we would find that it's about 10% accurate. And that's much like guessing a random uh, coin is 50% right, uh, accurate. However, we have no way to change the model's behavior when it gets things right, or we can't alter it when it gets things wrong. Our model's accuracy will always be 10%. Hence, a model is not a machine learning model. So, 10%, not that great. One in every 10 digits gets it wrong. So let's try a better approach. This time, we're going to relate a model to the image's darkness which might seem a bit strange, but you might expect an image of an 8 to be darker than an image of a 1, and maybe a little bit darker of an image of a 3. There's more ink involved, so there's more darkness. This model is a little bit better. In practice, we see that the uh, accuracy averages to about 22%, which is twice as good as randomly guessing. But it's still only 1 in 4, 1 in 5 getting it right. I think we can do better than that. Crucially, again, there was no way to alter the model's behavior. When it's dark, 
and predicts it to be an eight, it will always do that, regardless if it was just a really heavily uh, highlighted five. <laughs> so let's see if we can apply what we uh, just learned in the school metaphor for creating machine learning algorithms. Don't worry about the code in two details. This is an extract taken from a book that I dearly love called uh, Neural Networks in Deep Learning by Michael Nielsen. Uh, for those interested, this is, uh, what we, this is again what we call a neural network. But crucially, what this has is what the other two models didn't. It has a way to reward good test scores and punish bad ones. Every time it runs its own test, it will find a way to calculate how different the predicted value was from the expected value, and then alter the model in some way that favors the way that it got it right. Um, the key magic in here is uh, we have feed-forward back-propagation back approach. Uh, this takes the output of a cost function, cross-entropy in this case, to test how, wha how different the prediction was from the expected, and it alters the model uh, based on stochastic gradient descent, which, honestly, it's pretty simple. It's just based on the train rule of deriving matrices, except I said no maths. Um, <laughs> I'll breathe. Model here is a machine learning model. It had a test. The pr is the predicted value equal to the actual labeled digit? It has a way of determining a good or bad score. In this case, I said it was the cross-entropy function. And it has a way of altering the model's behavior, the stochast stochastic gradient descent. You don't have to know how it works. You just have to know that it's there. And there's a method of applying this uh, punishment or reward. But the MNIST is a pretty typical example. I said it was like the hello world of computer vision. In it, we had a very clear labeled objective. If our model didn't predict the correct label for the digit, then it's not up to scratch. Sometimes the test and the score aren't so clear cut. The inter interesting examples in the industry are when the test isn't so clear, and a bad score is equally just as vague. See, labeling digits is easy. But what about if you're trying to uh, transcribe somebody's piano playing and as an audio file and transcribe that into manuscript, music that somebody would read? This is a paper uh, called Onsets and Frames, Dual Objective Piano Transcription, and they tried to do just that. Now, the paper is full of uh, fun maths and data science jargon, but the point of interest here is when the authors tried to describe how they based the model accuracy for velocity. As they say, it's been a pretty hard nut to crack. I mean, sure, you can tell if a note written on paper is the same as the note that was played. You can even test whether the transcribed fo note falls on the same beat, give or take. But how do you capture dynamics, volume, expression? A note pitch is a note pitch, but what reference does a note's loudness have? Who's to say the recording just isn't really loud or there's a lot of background noise? Additionally, how do you correct a no given note's volume based on the when the context that it appears in is arguably more important? A soft note compared to a really loud note has different uh, meanings than if you would just have a sequence of soft notes. So, I love academic papers. The authors are kind of hand wavy at this point. They're saying that they've discovered a never before seen method to truly test whether their model perfectly transcribes the dynamics of a player forte, fortissimo, piano. However, it's important to note that all that's been done is some math magic to calculate a score based on the average volume of the recording. They didn't discover any brand new method. They simply defined a test. The test could have easily been uh, all notes of the correct volume if they're below negative five decibels. That's a test, and the model would have been really good at transcribing all notes that are below negative five decibels. So these are the three key things that we've got to uh, keep in our minds moving forward. To have a machine learning model, you have to have a test, a score, and then a way to punish or award based on that score. Sometimes these are pretty easy to understand. Say, for example, if is your digit equal to the labeled digit? Sometimes it can be a bit more vague in the case of when you're trying to transcribe music notes or when you're trying to 
play tic-tac-toe, for example. <sighs> so that was a lot. Uh, <laughs> but this creates the fundamentals of what we're going to use as we go through the journey on how you might do something strange. See, machine learning is more than just classification and regression. Machine learning can be used in any application that uses the three key principles when you define a test, when you calculate a score, and then provide some sort of punishment or reward. And if you don't believe me, well, this is where the fun comes in. Training an AI to play tic-tac-toe. Except that might not really get you convinced, right? Maybe I'm just going to pull out my Python and do some math magic, and then that doesn't uh, convince you at all. What about if we tried to find a scenario in which we didn't have any of that available to us? We don't have any code, we don't have any fancy compute. Yeah, I think this will do a better job. I mentioned before Arthur Samuel, who spent a large part of his career utilizing the best IBM computers at the time to create revolutionary new machine learning programs. I wonder what he'd think if he saw his whole life's work reduced to a slide deck. <laughs> Now, in true typical consultant fashion, I will label some caveats here and really define the scope of what we're going to be working with. <laughs> the aim of the game is to demonstrate that machine learning is no more complicated than any other algorithm once stripped down to its fundamentals. Hence, no code is allowed. Now, full disclosure, uh, I did use some macros. As you will soon see, to get this working involved many slides and many, many animations. So <laughs> to save myself an eternity, I hacked some old VBA scripts to automate the insertion of animations and slides. Uh, we will not be using these in the method for training the PowerPoint. I want to make that very clear. Secondly, for the game theorists out there, there is about uh, 255,168 possible games of tic-tac-toe. This number varies slightly depending on how you define what a game of tic-tac-toe is, but needless to say, that's a very big number. Um, so to narrow this down, I've reduced the problem to training a uh, PowerPoint tic-tac-toe to win in three moves. Or more likely, it's uh, training a uh, tic-tac-toe to not lose in three moves. But, you know, that doesn't, that's not as catchy. In addition, the AI will always make the first move, and always in a corner. See, the game of tic-tac-toe actually varies quite significantly depending on which player goes first. So we're going to just highlight one example of this game state. Where possible, we'll utilize reflections and rotations so that a computer will never make a move that is a reflection or rotation of another state that it can move to. What does that mean? In this example, there are only three places that an AI will try to place itself the left, the bottom left, and then the bottom. This is because the other blank spaces are just reflections of those moves. The uh, right and bottom right are just reflections of the left and bottom left. Us human players will have no such restrictions. This leaves us with a still not tiny number of 1,830 possible game states that you can have for tic-tac-toe. Um, I'll take the time here to thank the inspiration uh, that cursed me with this uh, project. Uh, <laughs> first was the work by a mathematician and comedian, uh, there are some of us who are funny, uh, by the name of Matt Parker, who ran a project on training a machine learning algorithm to play tic-tac-toe based on a set of matchboxes. And this was off the work of Donald Mickey uh, in 1961. If you ask me, they're kind of cheating a little bit. They only have to deal with the approximately 700 possible states that the tic-tac-toe board can be in, and there was a lot of human intervention. So, you know, not throwing any shade, but... The second uh, was a video by Tom Wilderheim, who really opened my eyes to the programming potential of uh, PowerPoint in his uh, Absurd Ideas in Computer Science PowerPoint Programming. Uh, it's a great watch. So PowerPoint, then. Now... I've heard from the streets that some people are under the false impression that PowerPoint is not the greatest tool ever invented. <laughs> you laugh? I'm shocked. I mean, 
PowerPoint has literally everything you could want from a programming language. It has text. It has <laughs> shapes. And most importantly, it has animations. <laughs> that's a totally random animation, by the way. It's the first time I'm seeing it. Uh, it's always fun. You may laugh, but the shapes and animations are actually the key to what allows us to form a real machine learning model with PowerPoint. Because they allow us to do something that developers take for granted every day, state management. In our model, each slide will represent a particular move from either the player or the AI. We will then use these shapes and animations to manage that state, to remember what they learn. So our model will consist of 1,830 states, which is 1,830 slides. Each slide state consists of the following. Simply, the board, which is the number of noughts and crosses in their relative positions to each other. Um, in this case, AI is cross and human player is naught. Uh, that just felt right. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> um, and also, we al contain all of the previous steps that got us to that state using uh, one of my favorite PowerPoint features, zoom transitions. So this encodes all of the information that got us to the state that we were in. It allows us to bop, but back propagate through each path and get to the slide that led up to it. So that's the state. That's what we're uh, trying to capture in a slide. But how do you transition from one state to another? Well, there are two different types of turns. There's a player's turn and an AI's turn. For the player, a collection of shapes that place a naught and navigate to the relevant slide uh, are on every single blank space. They're invisible, so they don't have any fill color or outline color, but they do have a hyperlink to the slide that is relevant. Every click on an empty space navigates the user to a new slide where that naught is in the location that was clicked. So for this slide, there are eight invisible shapes, but they are there, and they hyperlink to the relevant slide. When a user clicks one, we go to that slide. And notice in the top left-hand corner, we've saved the state of what it was previously by using the zoom transition. So that's the player, but what about the AI? How do we get the AI to navigate? And this is where things get interesting. Now, to be sure, a human player still clicks the AI. We're not building a PowerPoint to control a mouse just yet although don't give me any ideas. <laughs> For the AI, there is also a collection of invisible shapes, but these, these ones blink at semi-random intervals. The difference between this navigation and the previous navigation is that all the shapes are in the same place, except only one is visible at a given time. When a user clicks on the button labeled click to make AI move, I'm no UX designer, but oh, that's pretty self-explanatory, it instigates the animations of each shape below it clicking. So this is for demonstration. In reality, those shapes are invisible, and they're, clicking, uh, they're blinking a lot faster, and there's a lot more of them. So that's it. Our model consists of 1,830 game states. 301 of those each have an AI making a random choice to proceed to the next move. Now, I say random choice. Currently, it, we're set at a ground state for the model. And think of ground state as just predicting 50-50 on a coin toss. What we want to do is to change from that ground state into a state that is optimized for playing tic-tac-toe. How are we going to do that? Let's call back to what we learned just a few minutes ago. We're going to use machine learning, so we need to define a test, a score, and a way to punish or award the AI for making bad or good moves. So if we do this, we can verify that what we've indeed created is a machine learning model, an AI, for, uh, in a PowerPoint to play tic-tac-toe. First, our test. Uh, due to the limited time of a lone man's calendar and the absurd amount of games of tic-tac-toe, I said that this test is, does the AI win in three moves? The converse is true. Does the AI lose in three moves? Next, our score. 
Now, the number of winning games is not evenly distributed among the total number of games of tic-tac-toe. What I mean by that is there are far more games where neither the player nor the AI win. So for this score, we're going to consider three results. Pass, the AI wins. Neutral, neither the pl player nor the AI wins. And three, the AI loses. Passing represents the best possible score that we could get. And we want to encourage this as much as possible because it happens so few times. Um, the failing is a bit more common, but we want to discourage this from happening. And neutral is pretty much the most common. So this translates to how we're going to punish a reward. When an AI passes and it wins in the first three moves, we want to give it an extra chance so that it will navigate to each slide that leads to a winning move. That's signified by a plus three chance. Neutral, nothing happens. We don't want our AI to just lose all of its chances to navigate. Fail is we take away the chance to navigate to the particular slide that made it end up in a losing position. So how are we actually going to do this? This is the fun bit. This is the reason why we had to have that absurd uh, arrangement of shapes blinking and all of them on the slide. It's also why we have to stay, save the previous state that we were in throughout the whole path of the game. So I said that each move in the AI state has a, um, a, a absurd amount of blinking shapes. Now, these shapes represent the probability of moving from one state to another. In the ground state, I've initialized it with 10 shapes each to move to each available location that an AI can move into. In this slide, there are 70 pla uh, seven places that the AI can move to. They're the blank spaces, because there's no symmetry here. And because there's a uh, initialized with a 10 uh, shapes each to navigate to those slides, there are 70 randomly blinking shapes on this slide, each one representing a chance to navigate to the state that we're going to move to. So, when an AI runs a test, if the results were good, that is, the AI wins in the first three moves, then we will track the moves it took to get to that state. This represents the best possible play that an AI can make. Somewhere along the line, the player has made a mistake, and the AI has a chance to win, and it does. We want to reward this as much as possible. What I mean by that is we want to reward every state that came before it to appear again. So we add more of those shapes that are randomly blinking that hyperlink to those slides. And we backpropagate through every state with that. So it starts with no things, uh, no pieces on the board. When we click the AI moves, we want to encourage it then to move to the next state in which it will win. However, let's say the AI makes a bad play. Somewhere along the line, it might have even had a chance to win, but then it doesn't. It makes some sort of fatal error and leaves it open for the player to come in and attack. We want to discourage this from happening. If it's in a position where it can either win or draw, we don't want it then navigating to a slide which represents a state that a player can then win. So every time we run a test and it loses, we back propagate through every slide that we have and take away one of those shapes that uh, navigates to the slide that ends up losing. And that's for every single slide along the path. This way, when it's at a fork in the road, when it doesn't know where to put it, there is more chance that it will move to a slide that uh, wins or is neutral, but there is less chance that it's going to navigate to a slide that loses. If the test is neutral, that is, neither the player nor the AI win, uh, we simply just do nothing. So this is an AI that's initialized with random choices, but you'll be able to see as we go forward how it works. The player is just put in the center, and we click again to make the AI move. In this case, the randomly blinking shapes promoted us to navigate to a slide there. Now, a player made a mistake there. The AI has a chance to win here. An optimized model would put it on the top. But because there's an equal chance currently for the AI to uh, click onto the, navigate to the wrong slide, it doesn't. It makes a mistake. We're going to discourage this from happening 
by navigating back through every slide and taking away one of those randomly blinking shapes so that if it's ever in the same position again, it has less chance to navigate to that losing slide. And then we do it again. The AI will make a move in the top left-hand corner and the player will make another move. This time the AI made a different move. It's setting itself up right to win, but a player blocks it. The player now has a chance to win, so an optimized AI with all of the navigation uh, shapes configured correctly will try and put it in the bottom. But again, it makes a mistake. So moving forward, we discourage that by taking away every shape that leads to this state from the PowerPoint deck. And this is a long, grueling process. There is a question that I'm sure a lot of you have been asking throughout all of this. <laughs> How many games? Um, to be sure, I mean, it's great to say what machine learning is not, maybe break the stigma of how it can be used, but why does the fundamentals of the understanding of machine learning matter, besides the fun of knowledge for knowledge's sake? Why did I go through this whole process of constructing a way to train a PowerPoint to uh, go through a machine learning algorithm? What I hope is clear by now is the distinction between traditional control logic and the machine learning approach. And that's all it is, an approach. The difference suggests a fundamental change in how we conduct analysis, build automation, and program. In the other models we saw, predicting a digit based on its darkness, or randomly guessing are examples of this traditional logic. If this, then that. However, machine learning, if nothing else, is a tool that allows us to move past this constrained test. It's not possible to know every then this, and it's certainly too time consuming to label every then that. Machine learning allows us to tackle problems that we couldn't possibly know how to tackle. Machine learning is not just predicting digits or analyzing text sentiment, but any process in which we can test, score, and provide feedback. All of the advancements in machine learning, the maths, the, the distributed compute, are just ways that we can extend this process of uh, creating fa fancy tests, scoring it, and then running it again. In cases, like I said, the cross-entropy loss, which sounds pretty fancy, but all it is is a way of getting our list of numbers that we predicted and the list of numbers that we expected and doing a, uh, calculating a score that is kind of easy to comprehend. Sometimes it's not as easy, so the researchers have to go above and beyond to try and think about what they're even trying to test. An example like the audio transcription uh, paper that we saw where they were faced with a problem that isn't immediately obvious, what we do. So they, rather than diving into, let's just pump it with more compute power, it was, let's take a step back, and what is it that we're even trying to test? It's the are the other dynamics correct? In a PowerPoint example, it's not how can we somehow make some code in PowerPoint, although PowerPoint is true and complete. Um, it's a way of, analyzing what we have to work with, shapes, slides, and animations, and how can we use those to do the fundamental components of testing, scoring, and providing feedback by adding and subtracting shapes. The animation allows us to navigate through states, but it's simply taking away and adding shapes that allows us to provide feedback. In the end, machine learning taps into something that we take for granted, but applies it in a programmatic way. It's our ability to learn before knowing. So thank you. <laughs> On the slides here, I have uh, some of the resources that I did mention. Um, neural Networks and Deep Learning um, is the book uh, all around the fundamentals of neural networks. I started using the terms AI and machine learning a little bit interchangeably, but as I mentioned way at the beginning, machine learning is just one avenue that allows us to get through AI. And it's one of the most popular, and it's certainly useful. Um, neural Networks is another subset of machine learning. Um, 
it's a particular of interest of mine, um, but if anyone's uh, interested in learning more, I recommend that book. Onset and Frames, Dual Objective Piano Transcription is the paper that I maybe flippantly was uh, reviewing. I want to be clear that the Google Lab team and everyone that worked on that, the incredible work, um, but it does provide a good example of how in the real world sometimes how we test and how we score isn't immediately obvious. Menace, the pile of matchboxes which can learn. Um, if you want to look at this, but done in matchboxes, have a go at that. But I mean, they cheated, right? They had a whole bunch of people working. Um, this was just me in a PowerPoint, which is a lot sadder than uh, now I'm saying it out loud. Um, and lastly, great and practical ideas in computer science. PowerPoint programming is a hoot. It's a long one, but um, if you want to see a Turing machine in PowerPoint, there's your go. <laughs> If you're interested in a follow-up, um, you can at me on Twitter, LinkedIn. You can uh, go to the blog site that I occasionally write. Um, I do have a working version of this PowerPoint AI, as you saw in the video. It's not yet optimized for playing tic-tac-toe perfectly because it takes many, many iterations of running the test, adding and subtracting the shapes, um, and my friends didn't find that interesting on a Saturday night. So, um, yeah, please reach out to me if you're interested in versing a PowerPoint in tic-tac-toe. I lastly want to thank all of the sponsors for DDD. They're the people who allow us, uh, me, to stand up here and talk about something that I have no right to be uh, <laughs> talking about, a PowerPoint AI. Um, and also thank you to all the volunteers who woke up very early today um, to get this all working. Thank you. I think we have time for some questions. I was going to say, you're like, perfectly on time, so we've got five minutes for questions, if you want to. Yeah. I think we've got a question then, yeah. Oh, thanks. So you said machine learning is one of the ways to do AI. What are the ways? Yeah, it, AI is like as about as broad as term as you can get. Some people consider things like statistical models and everything to be part of AI. So that's not something that uses an iterative approach. Um, but, you know, things like probability tests and t-tests. Um, other people, uh, natural language processing is a really interesting example of AI that isn't machine learning. Um, because there's a whole bunch of still maths, still linear algebra and stuff, um, but they don't do the iterative approach. They just do like vector multiplication and um, stuff like that. That's simplifying it a lot, but there are, yeah, those are some of the examples. Next question, guys. Oh. Um, I was pretty impressed with what we've seen today, but I just wanted to ask what's next? Project what's wise? next? Oh, well, I mean, Go is one of the most complicated <laughs> games you can play, maybe. <laughs> no, um, I don't know. I mean, th to be honest, this is just a f fun example. Maybe I've spent too much time on it, but it, it was more of an exploration into how fundamental machine learning actually is. Um, I'm not sure I'd do something like this again. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> unless you sat me down in a torture room. But um, I can't stress enough how many hours it was to form that board. Um, but yeah, I'm always keen in investigating these sort of weird approaches. So, uh, anyone else? Lucky last question, guys. Anybody? Wonderful. Oh, oh, another. We've got another one here. Please. I'll talk about this for hours. Oh yeah. Um. Yeah, I'll ask some of the questions. So I was just curious with the um, PowerPoints. I never thought of it. But um, did you, so there's no code. You just literally have a PowerPoint that mm -hmm. just click through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So just someone just was manually. Someone was manually doing the um, like punishments and rewards. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, like I said, there was macros involved to like insert the slides. Um, like th I'm not gonna copy and paste one uh, thousand eight hundred and thirty slides. Um, but yeah, those those macros weren't used for the actual training of it because that kind of defeats the purpose. This would be easy to do it in VBA or something like that, but it wouldn't it defeat the purpose of the whole exercise. I think personally, I mean, maybe I'm just sadistic, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Look, thank you so much, Brenton. On behalf of all of us, that was a fantastic speech. And if I can, guys, a big round of applause. Thank you very much. That's it. All right, guys. In here in about 10 minutes, we're going to have George Coldham and Swen Lee.